so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The title of my sermon tonight is The Pressure of Providing. The Pressure of Providing. In Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 17. The Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So I've had a heck of a week. <laughs> Who knows what Murphy's Law is? Yeah, Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. And it all went wrong this week. <laughs> at work, during my, uh, at my business, it all went wrong. So, um, you know, it's just one of those weeks where I've also been dealing with some allergies for the last few weeks, and it's all been kind of um, coming to a head. And I haven't really focused on writing this sermon. In fact, I didn't even have a clue what I was going to put together until about Wednesday night when I started honestly thinking about it, like, oh, man, i got to put something together. And, uh, you know, it's just dealing with the people on the job and dealing with unexpected bills that came up and just recently paying the IRS, the, you know, the wicked government, to continue to... <laughs> Uh, manipulate and control us and, and all those things that we don't desire and uh, it you know just writing a sermon was one of the last things on my mind and I got to hand it to Brother Fannin I don't know how you do it <laughs> three times a week where you got all this pressure of life and taking care of the home front and making sure everything's been tidied up and put to bed I uh, I don't I don't know how you do it it's, it's really hard sometimes so my energy levels have been really down because of these allergies. I've got the pressure between my temples. I've had a, a low, dull headache, and, and I sound like I'm talking through my nose because I am. <laughs> and um, it's just been a real tough week, and I could go on and on and on if you wanted the, the details of it, but I'll spare you. But um, I started thinking, you know, sometimes it really gets tough, you know, and I want to preach on tonight the pressure of providing. And the first thing I want to realize and, and to express is this is actually the way God wants it to be. It's not supposed to be a bed of roses. And we can see in Genesis chapter 3 that it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat the bread. And, and because we're dust, we're going to become, we're going to return to dust. And in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. You know, so we're looking at a, a hard uphill struggle for the rest of our lives, guys. And, uh, and it's something that we need to embrace and we need to realize it's, it's just going to be that way. And one day, uh, we'll be living in a new earth. The, the ground won't be cursed anymore. We got that to look forward to. But right here and right now, we need to realize that, you know, it's going to be tough. And... I don't think I'm the only one that feels overwhelmed with life sometimes. Anybody else in the room? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes life can be overwhelming, right? But guess what? Today's been a pretty good day. And uh, I woke up this morning. I, I've got a PT test with the Army next week that I haven't been training for. So I got up and I ran. I did my push-ups and my sit-ups. And um, my allergies have been focusing uh, uh, been laying off a little bit, so it's been the first day I woke up and didn't have red eyes, and I can actually breathe a little bit better. So I went out and I uh, trained for that PT test. I wrote my sermon today, <laughs> and uh, took my family out to the farmer's market and worked in my own garden at home, and it's been a great day. So it doesn't really matter what kind of line of work you're in. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, how much money you earn or, or what you have on your plate, it's supposed to be hard. God designed it that way. And so uh, we all have this struggle. The women in our lives, they have the struggle of 
taking care of the home front, making sure the kids are fed and, and that they're being nourished and, and not only nourished in food, but also nourished on the Word of God. And, and that's our responsibility as well, men. But they, they have quite a job and it goes 24-7, as we know. And so we have a job of providing and making sure that we don't all starve to death. Um, but the, the pressure is always on our back. First Timothy, you don't have to turn there. Chapter 5, verse 8, as I'm sure you're all aware, it says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And like that is Second Thessalonians 3.10. The Bible reads, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So, we know that we as men, we are commanded by God to provide for our family. I actually enjoy that role. I, I enjoy providing. I like that that is on my, my shoulders and not on my wife's. I'd feel pretty bad about myself if I was sitting at the house and sending my wife off to work every day and depending on her to bring home the bacon. That would, that would not suit well for me at all. And not to mention, I could not sit at the house very long with my children and have the patience that she does. I couldn't do it. I am not cut out for that line of work at all. And she knows it, and I do too. <laughs> so I, I'm actually glad the way God has structured that in our lives. Um, but when we used to have cable television, and, and my wife, she loved to watch the Hallmark Channel. Or, or the Lifetime channel, or whatever. I think they're both one and the same. But uh, it was always the same uh, storyline, the same plot for every show. It was just different actresses and actors. And it was pretty much, you've got this mom, and she's struggling to, to get through and, and take care of the kids and all these things. And there's this workaholic dad who's never in the picture. And, and pretty much, I, I think that's just a... A feminist Nazi ran program shows but it's pretty much it makes every man out to be some deadbeat whether he provides or doesn't he's he's being portrayed in this negative light the whole movie the whole show and so I used to hate those programs and I would always say oh boy I better I better knock off work and make sure I'm home on time or I'm gonna be a Hallmark deadbeat dad you know but we should we should work until the job's done but at the same time, you got to get the work done. You got to get home. You do need to spend time with your wife and your kids. You need to make sure you obviously start your day off right and spend time in the Word and praying and, and spending time with the Lord. And so we have these commitments in our life. We got home, we got church, we got work, which is a major commitment. We've got extracurriculars. Um, you know, my son, I've got three daughters and one boy and and. He, he needs more male influences in his life besides just me. So my wife and I were talking and we decided to sign him up for T-ball this year. And since we don't want him to be subjected to the lowest common denominator on the T-ball team and just have him thrown in with the worldly kids, the only way we were going to do that was if I also participated and I become like an assistant coach and make sure I'm always there and, and watching what's being said and, and what type of environment my kid's going to be in because we obviously care, care very strongly about that. I, I signed up my son uh, about a month ago and I put on there, I checked off the block that says, would you be interested in coaching in any way? And I, I marked off yes. And I was thinking I could be an assistant coach. I can help out. When I'm not there, my wife can be there. Well, just a few days ago, they text uh, 10 random guys, including myself. I got a random group text message, and it said, Thank you, men, for volunteering to, to uh, be become a coach for the T-Ball League. And uh, I called the guy back, and I said, I don't think we're on the same page. I'm not actually asking to be the coach. I was thinking like a helper, an assistant coach. He's like, oh, well, I really need you to be the coach. And I'm like, well, I've never coached anything. And, and not to mention... I don't have the time to coach and to be the front man for all this. So looks like I'm going to be a coach. <laughs> so God help me on that. Anyways, we'll get through this. So you got family, you got work, you got church, you've got extracurriculars like T-ball and 
whatever, piano lessons to get the kids to. And then sometimes you just have random events, sometimes major setbacks. And thank God I haven't had any of those, but sometimes things that you haven't seen, that, uh, that you didn't see coming from a mile away and they show up and hit you between the eyes like a two by four. And it, it just sets you back big time, puts you back up against the wall. It could be a job loss. It could be an illness. It could be something of that sort. And, and you're just floored and you have to pick yourself up and you got to go. And so I wanted to look at tonight in the Bible how certain men of God reacted when their back was against the wall. And what do they do? So if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And we're going to look at how the kings of the Old Testament, who were men of God, who were saved, how did they handle the situations when their back was up against the wall they had nowhere to turn. And what did they do? Second Chronicles chapter 32. And look down at verse 7. This is Hezekiah. Hezekiah, as you know, is a man of God. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But <clears throat> the king of Assyria came and he's ready to attack him with about a hundred and or about close to two hundred thousand men. And so at verse 7, this is what the Bible reads. Hezekiah says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. After this, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem? But he himself laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. Unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and unto all Judah that were at Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Whereon do ye trust that ye abide in the siege of Jerusalem? So notice, they've come against Jerusalem, They've brought a, an enormous army and they've laid siege. They've got the city blocked in. They are surrounded. It looks like all hope is lost. And they're asking, where are you trusting to save yourselves? And I'm going to spare you uh, uh, some of the reading here. But verse uh, 20, jump down to verse 20. <clears throat> and the Bible reads, And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven, and the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. If you go back to Kings, you'll notice that this is 185,000 men that the angel of God cut down. So the king of Assyria returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was coming to the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and guided them on every side. Now turn back to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. So we see that what just happened, Hezekiah trusted in God. He called upon God to save the people, and God showed up in a mighty way and took care of business. We're going to see a very similar story happening back here in, in 2 Chronicles 14, this time with King Asa. In verse 1, the Bible reads, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days, the land was quiet for 10 years. So Asa comes on the scene. For 10 years, there's no wars. Peace. The land has quiet, right? Verse 2. And Asa did that which was, was uh, good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Skip down to verse 9. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand. Let me do the math for you real quick. That's a million men. A million. A thousand thousand. And 300 chariots 
and came unto Mereshah. Then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathah at Mereshah. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. Sound familiar? For we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let no man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. So we just saw two great examples of Hezekiah and King Asa going against an imposing, unstoppable force. They knew they had their backs against the wall. They had the pressure on them. They called upon God. God delivered them in a mighty way. Go to the next chapter, chapter 15, and the last verse. We're still talking about Asa here. It says, And there was no more war unto the fifth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. So we know that when Asa took over, and he was actually in charge for 41 years. He was, he was king over Judah for 41 years. The first 10 years, the land had peace. And then the Ethiopians showed up with their million-man army. God smites them. And then the land had rest for 35 more years. Something happened in Asa's life the second time around, because it happens again. Look in chapter 16 this time, and he actually handles it in a completely different way. Chapter 16 and verse 1, In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, to the intent that he might not let to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, Break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto king Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the city of Israel. And they smote Ijon, and Dan, and Ebelmaim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And, he came to, and it came to pass, when Basha heard that he left off building of Ramah, and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all of Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha was building, and he built there with Geba and Mespah. And at that time, Hanani the, uh, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Now listen to this, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a great, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time, and behold the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, and Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. So you can see that Asa handled the second time his back was against the wall. He handled it in a completely different manner. He did not throw his trust upon God. He put his trust in man. And, and not only that, he actually robbed the house of God to pay for the help of man. 
terrible, wicked thing that Asa did. Asa was still saved. He's still a man of God. We'll all get to meet him one day, but I'm sure he's looking back at this time of his life with great regret right now. So we have, we can draw similarities to this. We can also use this as men, as fathers, as providers for our family. When our back is against the wall, who are we going to put our trust in? Man or God? <clears throat> and you know, what happened between Asa the first time that God showed up for him and the second time, Asa had about 35 years of quiet, 35 years of rest, of prosperity and peace. Sometimes God doesn't want us to get too big for our bridges. He doesn't want us to be puffed up with our own selves. You know, you don't have to turn there. We're wrapping this up. Proverbs 37 and 9 says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me not them before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of the, my God in vain. And it's not, it's not fun to say, God, just give me what I need. No, we always want in our selfish way to have more than enough that we can rest and take it easy and not have to work so hard. But that's not where God wants us. God wants us to rely on Him on a daily basis. And you'll never go wrong relying on God. You'll always be able to look at and say, that's where God helped me there. That's where God helped me there and there and there and there. Where would I be without the Lord? Instead, we can start trusting in our own riches. We can put our trust in man. And that's going to fail us. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be real bad. I was going to end this sermon tonight by saying, embrace the struggle, gentlemen. We can all rest when we're dead. <laughs> but I'm not going to leave you hanging with that. Instead, you don't have to turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. When your back's against the wall, think back on all the things that God's done for you and encourage yourself in the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to get to preach tonight. I ask that you bless the next preacher that he may come up and boldly proclaim your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.